participants, and I really appreciate their participation and then uh, their help. Uh, so this lecture is about open data and big data analytics for enhancing transparency, anticipatory and responsive governance. Uh, and then also uh, this topic is uh, related to our uh, the class too. I think that uh, particularly open data, big data part is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, topic. Uh, this is a part of lecture series on strengthening the public governance for achieving the 2030 agenda. First, let me introduce Mr. Shinbogyun. He's the head of office of the United Nations Project Office on Governance, an integral part of the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Governance, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Since his inauguration in March 2020, he has been dedicated to contribute to strengthen the uh, public administration capacities in developing the member states to advance the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And then he's gonna uh, the, show you the, uh, the talk about the overview of this lecture first, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Zhang, and for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Bo Gyun Shim, head of the United Nations Project Office on Governance part of the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the Korean University Department of Public Administration for inviting UNPOG to deliver a series of three lectures on strengthening public governance for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I would also like to thank Professor Hail Jung, Jin Uk Che, and Ung Yun Lee for their coordination of, to make this lecture series happen. We are currently undergoing a time when promoting inclusion of youth and ensuring leaving no one behind is imperative more than ever. Young people can be a force for development as well as drivers of innovation and progress at the local, national, and global levels. They are also the first to embrace new ideas and are pivotal to, to ensuring inclusiveness and equality in societies. Through delivering a series of three lectures on thematic issues at Korea University, I hope it could enhance awareness and knowledge of the youth on the 2030 agenda and youth engagement in implementing the sustainable development goals. As young leaders of tomorrow, it is pivotal you, the, uh, you are informed the, and engaged with the global vision for the future. I hope this lecture series can serve as a meaningful opportunity to share innovative strategies and country practices of government innovation for SDG implementation. UNPO has been attaching great importance on engaging the youth for SDG implementation. We have successfully organized four youth forums on SDG implementation since 2017. The youth forum co-organized by the Ministry of Interior and Safety of the Republic of Korea, Incheon Metropolitan City in collaboration with the Ministry of Environment is organized to provide a platform for young people to share their vision and to elaborate their substantive contribution in achieving the 2030 agenda. Through a competitive selection process, nine youth applicants will receive the ministerial and the mayor awards. We look forward to your interest and participation. I would like to take this opportunity to strongly encourage you to uh, encourage you to participate in the fifth youth forum on SDG implementation, which is scheduled to be held in 10th September this year. I thank thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Shim. Uh, thank you for your introduction. So now that I want to uh, introduce two lectures today's uh, uh, for the today's lecture. Uh, first lecture, uh, Miss Bigyong Park. Uh, that she's a governance and public administration officer. Her specific research areas include governance, government innovation, 
ICTs and digital government for SDG implementation, innovation in public service delivery, participatory that uh, and uh, inclusive governance, the inclusion of vulnerable groups and leaving no one behind and SDG localization. Please welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, yeah, Professor Chang. Ms. Bak. And then the second lecturer, Mr. Uh, Keping Yao. Uh, he is a senior governance and public administration expert. His areas work include strengthening public administration, capacity for advance in the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, digital government, innovation in citizen engagement, ICT for development, government innovation, and open data for disaster risk reduction. Please welcome. Uh, uh, Keping Yao. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you. Nice to Thank meet you. you. Yeah. You. Uh, so, could you share the screen and start the lecture? Yes. Thank I you. I will share the screen. Yes. Ah, one more thing. So, uh, the after the lecture, that please go to the link in the chatting room and finish the survey about this lecture. Uh, we truly appreciate that then. Thank you. Okay. Hi, good. Yeah, next please, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, hello again, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, before we uh, move to the, um, uh, the, this presentation, uh, I would like to give you some background information to set the scene for this, uh, for this uh, lecture, the why we select this theme for this uh, uh, presentation. So first, one, first of, all, of all is that the more data is now, next please, yeah. More data is generated and stored than any other time in history. The exponential growth of computing and networking capabilities combined with, com with openness has enhanced the potential impact of data and offered the society an unprecedented opportunity to drive social, economic, and economic change. So nowadays we all, all call that data as a new uh, currency or new strategic asset. And also now data is the fuel of the informa information age revolution. Actually it has played important roles uh, in many areas such as like a precision agriculture, smart grid, smart transportation. And also artificial intelligence has been treated as a new frontier of a competition among countries. Yeah. And also the pace of a digital transformation has accelerated and the internet has become a lifeline, especially during the public health emergencies like COVID-19. The social media has become very important information sources. Now also government are more reliant on data for decision-making, we so called the uh, data-driven decision-making. And also we are now living a time of great uncertainty the complex systems and the problems has become the norm rather than the exception. So the traditionally a reactive approach to setting the policy is proving increasingly ineffective. Yeah? And also we need to also caring and uh, engaging vulnerable groups to building an inclusive society. So that this desegregate data and the data analytics has all become very important in this area. And also um, citizens now become more demanding. They require governments to deliver more and better with and faster with less resources. Because the citizens now um, can use the social media, they are empowered by social media. They can press the government to, for quick responses. So the slow responses by the government can make the small problems to involve into big disasters. Yeah. And also during the ongoing COVID-19, open data and big analytics, particularly through artificial intelligence art platforms and the data visualization tools, are empowering governments to predict the virus muta mutations, track virus spread in real time, and identify uh, medications for treating COVID-19. So governments are using big data analytics to get prepared, react effectively, 
and develop both short-term and long-term strategies. So data, at the one hand, they can empower the uh, public institutions to predict the trends and take preemptive actions. They can also empower a public institutions to better respond to involving and a dynamically changing citizen needs. Yeah. Next, please. So just to give you some uh, key terms that uh, how the data are treated as a key uh, source resource for governments. I pick up like a data informed. So this kind of term, you can also hold a lot. So the data uh, have become a very important aspect of a, of a government decision process, so-called data informed. And also we heard a lot about data driven. Data driven means that the government are more, uh, you are more reliant on you to use uh, analytics and algorithms in decision making. And also we heard a lot about the data centric. So where the government uh, plays data and the data science at the core of a public administration and data also are seen as a key asset and central to government functions. And also they are leveraged for the provision and evaluation and the modification of people-centric services. Next, please. So when, we, when you think about data, uh, what comes to your mind? So um, now I uh, turn the floor uh, to uh, Mikyong uh, to do a man-to-meter exercise. Yeah. Mikyong, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Kevin. Uh, now, I would like to, before we begin our presentation, I would like to invite all students to kindly share uh, and contribute your thoughts um, through uh, answering this question. Let me open another screen. I hope everyone can see the screen. So all students, may I ask you to uh, use your either laptop or mo even mobile phone to type in www.menti.com to, uh, to share your ideas. And there you will see um, a, a code, a place where you can enter a code. So for example, Yes, you can see this page, so you can enter the code uh, here. Yes, I hope everyone has access this website. And then my question here is, what are the two words that come to your mind when you think about or hear the word data? Could you type two words with your mobile phone or, um, or, or um, computer? Oh, very good. I, I see that many students are, are connected. Yes. We, I think we have around uh, slightly less than 60 per, uh, students here. And I want to uh, also know before we begin, what are the words, thoughts uh, that you would have? Yes, I uh, here for your information, the bigger the size of the um, lettering is, um, the more uh, often, uh, answers that you uh, have inputted. Yes, I see big data, uh, the biggest information, AI, artificial intelligence. I also see internet, statistics, yes. Uh, what else? Technology, coding, computer knowledge, data mining, yes, 3D print printing, connectivity. Yes, let's see. Uh, around yes, 30, 36 participants have uh, have uh, entered uh, uh, your ideas. Uh, thank you. And privacy, yes, uh, I already see quite many of the ideas that you have shared, uh, and that we see here in Word Cloud will be indeed covered during our um, throughout our lecture today. So, um, for th thank you for your your. Uh, contribution. There will be one more time when you will be invited to put another uh, contribution. So, so uh, I would suggest that you have this uh, website maybe uh, keep, uh, connected with you. So let me go back to the presentation. 
yes. So if you, in the meantime, if, uh, if you have any questions, please let us know um, and leave your questions um, through the chat box uh, at the bottom of the Zoom. So hope we could have uh, time to cover your questions after our presentation is finished uh, as much as possible. Yes, then I would like to move on to uh, start uh, the main part of the con uh, presentation. First, this is the content. First, we'll have a background on uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and uh, the public governance. And second, uh, the, the main theme of open data and big data analytics for transparent, anticipatory, and responsive governance will be um, will be. Uh, uh, the next part. And then we'll also see how leveraging data uh, and youth engagements are, are relevant for SDG implementation. And we'll finish with major policy issues. And firstly, I would like to briefly introduce the work of uh, uh, our office, UN Project Office on Governance, which is a, a part of the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government of UN DESA, uh, as Mr. Shim, head of our office, has also introduced. And UN POG's principal mission is to strengthen the public governance capacities of developing member states in Asia and the Pacific and beyond to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And uh, uh, th through our work activities in three pillars, research and policy analysis, capacity development, and outreach and networking, we aim to strengthen capacity of governments to build institutions for SDG implementation, to enhance government capacity to promote innovation in public service delivery, to strengthen government capacity to develop open innovation systems for stakeholder engagement. So um, for further information on our organization and our our activities, please uh, find, uh, please uh, visit our website here at umpog.org. And um, to briefly explain uh, about, uh, uh, about the 2030 agenda, in 2015, all UN member states have agreed uh, on uh, the agenda to achieve sustainable development and adopted 17 uh, sustainable development goals and 169 targets uh, to be achieved by 20, year 2030. And the goals are uh, widely ranging in three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. And the agenda is set out uh, to uh, out of a 15 year plan to achieve the goals which are comprehensive, far reaching and people centered um, and universal and transformative. So for all the details of 17 goals and um, 169 targets, you can visit uh, the website as well as the original document of the, uh, the 2030 agenda. Here in the PPT, I have made the link so that you can easily uh, uh, have an access to it. And um, the ST 17 SDGs can be categorized into five P's, if you see here on, your, on the left, which are people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and planet, which are also interlinked. And uh, the important overarching principle of 2030 agenda is leaving no one behind that the goals and targets uh, uh, are to be met for all nations and peoples and all segments of the society and endeavor to reach the furthest uh, behind or those who are marginalized or, or uh, in vulnerable situations such as children, youth, persons with disabilities, older persons, uh, indigenous peoples, refugees and, and migrants. Yeah, and before I move on to the next, um, slide, I would like to once again invite uh, you to another, this time, quiz. So among the 17 SDGs that I have uh, introduced, which goal do you think is most relevant to public governance? So here are the 17 goals. Again, please go to the www.menti.com, use a code, and please select your answer. Which goal among the 17 you think are most relevant to public governance? I see four people have answered. We can, we can have a, a few more minutes, a few more seconds. 
um, for other students to answer. I see one uh, uh, goal for quality education. I, oh, I see four and five people on goal 11 on sustainable cities and communities. I also see two um, reduced uh, inequalities. 13 on climate change. I also see one on uh, good health and well-being, two on, on zero hunger, se uh, three on 17 on partnerships. Yes. Okay. Maybe, yeah, I see more people um, uh, uh, putting their answers. So let's have maybe 10 more seconds to see. More people voting on goal 11. Okay, I'll, I'll close the poll. So this is um, the suggest, uh, selections from your side. Thank you very much again for your um, participation. Let's see. Let's go back to the PPT. Well, indeed, the most relevant goal to public governance would be goal 16, and especially the one that uh, we are we will be discussing in today and in public governance in general will be related to uh, goal 16 uh, and uh, the target 16.6, 60.7, which are developing effective, accountable and transparent institutions at all levels and ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory and representative de decision making at all levels, as well as reducing corruption uh, and so forth. Yet, uh, I will not say your other selections are not wrong because goal 16 is indeed a cross-cutting goal, uh, which is a cross-cutting enabler for achieving all other goals and targets. So uh, yeah, thank you very much again for your contribution. This is um, a, the background about the SDG 16. And um, in 2018, UN Committee of Experts on Public Administration has developed the principles, 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development. So what are uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, aspects uh, in, of uh, effective governance? Here, uh, the principles as well as commonly used strategies are introduced. As you can see on, on the left, uh, there are effectiveness, accountability, inclusive. Inclusiveness. So these are the main uh, uh, categories under which eleven principles are introduced. And here in the in the uh, boxes, you can see, for example, for the principle of sound uh, policy making to enhance effectiveness of public governance. Uh, here are the list of strategy, strategies commonly used. The strategies um, that could be used, for example, strategic planning and foresight. Uh, promotion of coherent policy making, strengthening national statistical systems. I remember that in the Word uh, document, um, one of the students have also mentioned statistics, statistical systems, monitoring and e evaluation, and science and policy interface, risk management frameworks, and data sharing. And we could also see there are uh, other principles as well as uh, um, strategies for other parts. Due to time constraint, I, want, I will not go over one by one, but again, you can also visit, uh, click here and then visit the full source uh, for the, the, the whole uh, principles of effective governance as well as um, the strategies. Next, so now let's move on to the main theme of uh, today's presentation, data. So uh, among the 17 SDGs, SDG 17, um, specifically in these uh, two uh, targets, uh, emphasize the importance of uh, enhancing capacity of countries to increase the availability of quality, uh, timely and reliable disaggregated data, and also the statistical capacity building of uh, countries, especially developing countries. And specifically here, we can see how big data 
uh, can um, enhance contribute SDG implementation. I don't know whether you can uh, see the the details of uh, of the information here, but you can see, for example, for goal three, big data can map the movement of mobile phone users uh, to predict the spread of infectious diseases. diseases. Indeed, this is uh, the case that uh, uh, we are also uh, currently witnessing in this current COVID-19 situation and uh, will be also further elaborated in the later part of uh, our presentation. For example, gender uh, equality of the goal five can see that analysis of financial transactions, the data on the financial transactions can also uh, give us insights on the spending patterns and different impacts of economic shocks on men and women. And um, let's take another uh, look at another one on goal 16 on peace, just and strong institutions, which uh, says the big data analytics uh, uh, on social media, for example, can reveal the public opinion on effective governance, public service delivery, or human rights. So these, all the specific examples, you can also refer to the information. And if we go back to the uh, 11 principles of uh, effective governance for sustainable development that I have mentioned uh, in my previous slides, you can see here how for these effectiveness, accountability and inclusiveness, how data uh, both directly and indirectly are, are is related to achieving these uh, principles. So you can see uh, for effectiveness, data sharing is important, monitoring evaluation and uh, accountability, open government data, which will be explained in the second part uh, will be also is also important. And for inclusiveness, data disaggregation based on, on gender, on income level and location and so forth uh, uh, is also critical. So this is the first part uh, on the background uh, about the second part on open data and big data analytics for transparent, anticipatory and responsive governance. Capping will continue uh, with the second part. Capping back to you. Okay, thank you, Mikkel. Next, please. So this chart is very uh, important. So, so uh, this uh, uh, chart will help you to understanding some basic concepts and interactions uh, between this kind of big data and open data and the government data. <clears throat> so from here, you can see that uh, some big data are open and also government also produce some big data like a, a satellite image that provides the public and also uh, like a precipitation figure data. And, uh, and also the government uh, are also now open, opening more and more data sets to, uh, the, to the public. So now uh, we call it uh, the intersection between open data and the government data, or so-called open government data. Next, please. And also this one is some uh, basic concepts about data, especially the so-called public data is very uh, ev self-evident. What does it mean? Yeah, it means that uh, all data are available in the public domain. Yeah, so you can have free access yeah, to that uh, data. And also the uh, sensors and the survey data. This is also a very important concept for, for you. Sensors, uh, I remember that uh, the Korean government uh, uh, a few months ago, they conducted a 10-year pop, uh, population census. It's kind of uh, cover all whole population. The survey data, uh, it's kind of a cover, uh, just a user sampling to collect the data from the certain uh, percentage of people, like household survey, land use survey, yeah. And also uh, about administrative data, so such as like uh, uh, tax re returns, you know, the business registers, all this kind of data we call the, um, administrative data that are performed by government institutions. And also we now also we have a so-called open government data, which are the part of the data that are open to uh, and available in the public domain. Next, please. And also the big data, we will also have a further elaboration on this. They are characterized by the three Vs. They're kind of a high volume, high uh, velo velocity, and a wide variety. And also, we also heard a lot about the uh, geospatial data has now become more and more important, especially for like a, a disaster risk reduction, and also for the uh, like uh, um, uh, mitigation of the disasters. Yeah. And also, we also heard a lot about real-time data. So these are data, the constant streams of live data delivered immediately after the collection. Next, please. 
And also, when we talk about the data, uh, uh, we we um, we, uh, we we call those data we, which are free to use, reuse, or distributed. Yeah? So uh, this kind of three terms are very important. Yeah, you can be free to use and reuse and redistribute data. Data as an asset has a different uh, uh, feature like uh, than any other assets. So we know that any other assets, when you use it, you have a depreciation, the less value. But the data is different. The more you use it, the more value that it can create. Yeah. So uh, there are two dimensions of a data openness. One is legally open. It means that uh, uh, um, you have no uh, legal restrictions. Yeah, you can free to use. And also you should be technically open. Technical open is also very important. It means that uh, uh, those kind of data are uh, in publishing electronic formats uh, that are mach machine readable. For example, the PDF file is not a readable, machine readable. You cannot use, uh, um, but the so-called so CSV files, you can use freely. So the machine readable is also very important. Um, but it's a friendly for the public to use. So the data must also be publicly uh, available and accessible on a, a public server without a password or file uh, wall restrictions. Yeah. And also to make open data um, easy to find, uh, now more and more institutions are created and are managing the open data catalogs in their website to make the uh, uh, public to easy to understand the data availability. Next, please. And also for the data open data initiatives, they could be either at a country level initiatives or at the city level or subnational level. It can be also at the level of individual agencies uh, with a specific thematic focus. Next, please. And also I'll just list, uh, list some uh, uh, select countries, their open data on their uh, national uh, portal, uh, like Australia, Brazil. You, you can see that not just developed countries, but also some developing countries, they are also putting great emphasis to open the data to the public. And also, for example, Republic of Korea has also uh, the national data portal. Next, please. Yeah. So uh, if you go to the data.geo.kr, uh, you can find this kind of open data portal for the government from the uh, government. You can see also the many data sets that are listed uh, in the website. Next, please. And also this one, it's a, 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 a open data portal for government of Philippines. So you can see that their data, data sets are categorized in different category. Yeah, like uh, um, a national governance, education and training. Yeah, so uh, you can easily find the information you would like to have. Next, please. And also uh, at the city level, you can, I also select some, uh, um, pick up some uh, uh, cities. Like uh, um, you, you can also see that, uh, uh, yeah, some developing countries, they also do that. Also, um, the Seoul city, Seoul metropolitan uh, city, they also has a city uh, open data a portal. You can also go to visit uh, to find some more information for your uh, daily life. Next, please. And also this one, it's uh, uh, open data for, from uh, the city of Vancouver. So uh, from the left, uh, right hand, you can see that they are organized the data sets by uh, themes, yeah? And also on the left side, you can see there's kind of a privacy uh, statement. And also they also provide some API uh, for you to, um, uh, to managing and also to use the data. Next, please. So as I said that uh, um, the more value added from open data uh, with new products and services, the more data demand will generate it. So um, the citizens will put more pressure and a request to the government to relieve more data sets. And also, of course, meanwhile, uh, the citizens would require the higher quality data. Here, it's kind of a several kind of uh, apps uh, or several initiatives or services uh, based on this open data in the area of environment, in the area of uh, like budget and spending, in the health and education and also uh, in the public service delivery, like a police UK, yeah. So um, for example, in the budget and the spending, um, um, citizens can have a more closer scrutiny of what it has spent by the government, yeah, open spending. Next, please. 
And also, of course, I mean, uh, uh, the uh, international organizations has, uh, uh, also has uh, great initiatives to push forward the, the drive for open data. Uh, the uh, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Organization, they also have a so-called Our Data Index. Uh, they, um, for this kind of index to measure the open, useful, reusable uh, government data, uh, they have uh, three pillars. Uh, the first pillar is the data availability. For example, about the, they have uh, three uh, sub pillars like a content, container wise, whether they can open by, whether they have the uh, 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 government has open by default policy, whether the CX uh, they, they have a uh, um, uh, approach to engage in stakeholder, uh, for stakeholder engagement, for data release, and how they implement it. The second pillar is about data, data accessibility. Again, the first uh, uh, container-wise, whether the data portal provide unrestricted access to data, and whether they uh, engage stakeholders for improving the data quality and also the data completeness. And also for the uh, third pillar is the government support for data re reuse. You know, whether the government has an initiative to uh, promote the data, uh, and also for data partnership, whether they have any program to enhance the data literacy in government. Yeah and whether they have any kind of a mechanism to monitor the impact of the data. Next, please. This one is uh, uh, the report from 2020, the open uh, um, useful uh, data. So you can see that uh, based on the three pillars, yeah, they uh, measure the, the, this kind of in our data index. So on the top, maybe a little bit small, but later you can go Google to find the report. So uh, actually the, um, the Republic of Korea has been ranked number one for consecutive uh, five or three years, you know. Next please. And also about the open government data, in, uh, the further step is about over open government data initiatives. Now uh, it means that uh, you, if you recall the first uh, chart I share with you, that open data intersection of the data, open data and the government data so now the um, governments and share more and more information with the public through the open government portals. Yeah. So a government is now pursuing more initiative like uh, uh, the open by default policy. And actually the open government data can also strengthen the democracy and improve the government work through increased participation, collaboration and transparency. So actually uh, with the data opening more to the public, so public are more empowered, they're more informed to be uh, more meaningfully engaged in a, uh, in a uh, policy um, uh, consultation or decision-making process. Yeah. Um, and also the open government data actually, they can also create new jobs, new uh, opportunities, new businesses uh, so, uh, to promote economic growth. So um, in many countries, uh, the young people, they use the open government data to create the new apps and to support the government. And they also, some of them, they started their own business uh, with the open government data. Next, please. And also this figure, and uh, um, they um, demonstrate the value uh, uh, of the open government data. So not just uh, the participation, transparency. So at minimum, they promote the transparency in government. They can also uh, enhance uh, the participant and collaboration. In the meantime, they can also improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the government. And also they can create new services and business. Please. I would like to share with you some findings from the UN e-government survey 2020, uh, the, our the latest version of the, this survey some general uh, trends about open government data. So this chart shows that uh, now more and more countries has uh, um, institute open government data portals. The open government that open government initiatives uh, um, is a start around like early 2000. Yeah? But you can see that over the years, the open government data trend is really uh, developed very progressively. Uh, even over the past uh, six years, you can see that uh, um, in 2014, we only have 46 OGD portals, but uh, uh, the last year we already have 153 open government data portals. Next, please. 
And also, uh, you can see uh, that uh, um, the percentage of a country that was associated uh, features of open government portals. So more and more country, uh, yeah, with national portal we just mentioned, and also more uh, country. I don't know why this kind of uh, percentage decreased with the OGD policy. And also, uh, uh, the more country has uh, uh, like metadata uh, about the data. It means the description of the data of the about the data. And also more countries accept the public requests for new data sets. Yeah. So especially this one is important for the academia and the research. Yeah. They can, if they think that some data sets are very important for the research purpose, they can want to request more data. And also this one, uh, it's about offer the guidance on using open government data. So this is also very important, uh, even though you have many data, but if you, less people to use it, then there's no value. And also this one is about uh, how many countries they have the promotion efforts for the OGD. For example, they can use the deck hackathons to trigger the interest of the public to use the open government data. Next, please. This one is about the, the, the sectoral uh, data, open government data. <clears throat> so it's about the five regions. You can see that uh, <clears throat> the most uh, um, uh, areas, two areas that uh, they have a more open government data is uh, in environment. And also another area is uh, in um, health. You know? Yeah, this one is about the sectoral open government data. Next, please. Yeah, also the open government data uh, has become a very important tool for government to address the, the public health emergencies. Yeah, this one is, uh, uh, um, how to say, the quick uh, change. You can see that a quick change of the um, increase of the open government data portals related to the uh, COVID-19. So within like a short two months, you know, less than a um, short two months, the those kind of uh, the, um, the percentage of the countries that have this kind of a designated portals with COVID-19 information increased to 94%. You know, nearly all countries has this kind of uh, um, data portals with uh, COVID-19 information. Next, please. And also this one, it's about those countries that allow individuals and business to access their own data. This one actually is very important because the government as a depository uh, of the data for either individual and businesses. But uh, uh, this one uh, means that the, uh, those kind of countries, they have the right to check their own data. And also they have a right to correct that, that, that data. Uh, if the, uh, the government uh, um, deposit the wrong data about them. Next, please. So this one is a trend about sharing uh, public information online. Yeah. So um, we have uh, like a four uh, legends. Yeah. The the first legend is about uh, how many, what kind of uh, uh, countries, uh, what kind of uh, type of source of information they provide. So this one is about also again about those kind of essential public services to the public, the justice, social protection, em employment, uh, education, health, environment. Yeah. So uh, it, it uh, demonstrates uh, yeah, how many countries that provide sources of information on policies, whether they provide information, government expenditure. And also this kind of uh, most right to bars also are important. So one is uh, machine readable formats. Another one is uh, uh, machine non-readable formats. Yeah. If it is down reader format, then especially for the researchers and for the users, it's less friendly, not, not easy to use. Yeah. Next, please. So this one is a, um, a, a number of a country, the public government uh, vacancies online. So this one is very important, one of the important steps for the government to and fight corruption. Next, please. This one uh, is about the, uh, how many countries uh, they have the um, information on the people's right to access government innovation. So you may hold a, a lot about FOIA, the Free Information Act, Free Access of Information, Free uh, Online Information Act. Yeah. So many, this kind of a, a basic legal foundation for the public to access the public information. So many countries have this FOIA. Next, please. This one, it's a, a number of countries offering selected features online into, into action. So, um, 
So uh, many um, open government portals that provide the, uh, the calendar of events about e-participation activities. So the citizens can be prepared and pre-informed uh, uh, about what's the upcoming events for the consultation. And also, uh, it also shows how many portals with the e-tools for public consultation and deliber uh, deli or deliberation. And then how many portals with social media networking tools. Yeah? So the, the citizens can uh, easily uh, use the social media to uh, connect with the government. Next, please. Yeah, so this one is kind of some uh, selected feedback, feedback features and reporting features, yeah. So we can see over the past uh, two editions of the UNE government survey, you can see a uh, uh, lot of increase in, the, in those kind of features for the citizens to interact with the government. They can either leave a feedback or they can report corruption by public servants. And also they allow the person to file a complaint about a public service delivery. Next, please. So now with the much about the uh, uh, open data or an open government data, now uh, I would like to um, move to the big data. So what is big data? Um, so driven by innovation and technology, we have witnessed the widespread and the constant use of telecommunications and other digital devices. Now we are more reliant on, on, on cell phones and you know, we spend a lot of time to on uh, social media as well. So, so all this kind of uh, digital information are, are, are created continuously uh, generated as we uh, log on to the social media to make the to click the like or dislike on, on, on the, some uh, new uh, some uh, some social media message yeah. Uh, so such data such as like a global uh, position system devices that data generated from GPS devices, ATM machines, uh, scanning devices, and also all the security cameras, for example, all the, and also sensors, mobile phones, satellites, social media, that creates all this kind of data are called, uh, generate, uh, are called big data. So they have like three Vs, you know, there's some people that, uh, there are some other kind of categorization that are five Vs, you know. But anyway, the, the general uh, characteristics of the big data is called high volume, high velocity, and a wide variety. And also all this data require new tools and methods for capturing, managing, and uh, processing. Next, please. So uh, in a year of a big data, so many countries already uh, announced the so-called big data strategy. The US uh, and also the White House already um, announced uh, uh, um, consecutively two or three kind of initiatives on the big data uh, strategy. And the Japan also has a basic strategy, you know. And also Australia, Canada, China, you know, um, based on the, <clears throat> uh, the member states questionnaire that we launched in, in 2020, we found that uh, there's uh, more than 60 countries out of like the one, uh, 30 respond countries. They all reflect that uh, they included the, the big data strategy in their digital government development. Yeah. So uh, the more and more countries attach great importance of this uh, uh, big data. And also Korean government also, uh, they also uh, has uh, set up the strategy and also they have uh, the, have a collaboration with a, a, a private sector with academic uh, to have the partnership to better use the data for the economic and the social gains from the big data. And also um, they have the national master plan on big data, the ident assign the respondent agencies and also uh, they work together to ensure the applicability and the benefits to the public. Next please. And also the big data analytics, What's the, what, what is big data analytics? I mean, uh, we have a different definitions. For example, the SARS, they said that big data analytics examine large amounts of data to uncover hidden patterns, correlations, and other insights. Yeah? And also IBM, they said that the big data analytics is use advanced analytical techniques against very large diverse big data sets. They include structured and semi-structured and unstructured data from different sources. So through this big data analytics, they can help organizations to identify new opportunities and increase the new uh, uh, efficient, new, uh, new uh, 
uh, profits, new um, new benefits. Please. And uh, for example, this one, IBM said that the big data analytics, uh, um, they can um, reduce the cost and also make the faster and better decision making and also generate uh, more uh, new product and services yeah, in line with the demands from the customs space. And also uh, there's a, a, some major technologies and tools to conduct this big data analytics. I will not uh, list all, I pick up some just. For example, the machine learning, machine learning is just a specific subset of AI that trains the machine uh, how to learn makes it possible to quickly and automatically produce models that can analyze the bigger and more complex data. And also like a data management tool, like data mining. Data mining means that to help uh, the users to examine large amounts of data to discover patterns, yeah. And also this kind of head loop, you may heard a lot about it. This one is a tool technology to analyze those kind of unstructured data. Next please. And also about a predictive analytics. Yeah, this one is very important Yeah, Predictive analytics uh, technology use the data and the statistical algorithms and the machine learning techniques to identify the likelihood of future outcomes based on the historical data. So uh, the typical uh, use, it's also like a predictive uh, policing. The police department, uh, they use this kind of uh, predictive analytics to, um, um, to um, analyze the patterns and also they move their police forces in a more flexible way to react quickly to any emergencies. Yeah. And also about the text mining, yeah, they, especially they use the machine learning to analyze all these text messages. Next, please. And also we said a lot about this uh, big data analytics and uh, the big data analytics are very important for the ant anticipatory governance, yeah. So what is called the data anticipatory governance? So anticipatory governance is a data-driven movement, yeah. So uh, it's, a, it's also a system of institutions, rules and norms that provide a way to use the full site this one is very important for site networks and the feedback for the purpose of reducing risk and increasing the capacity to respond to events earlier rather than later stage of a development. Yeah. Next, please. So, so anticipatory uh, governance is kind of it's kind of a systematic embedding and, and application of a strategy for site throughout the entire governance architecture. They include policy analysis, engagement, and decision making. So, the to conduct the anticipatory uh, governance and the strategic foresight is uh, very important. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of a stru structure and explicit exploitation of a multi feature, uh, multiple features uh, to inform decision making. Next, please. So why the anticipatory uh, governance is important? Uh, the reason is that our society is experiencing accelerating deep change, change, yeah? So which kind of a challenge adaptive capacity of a whole society? So as I was mentioned before, it said that we are really living in a society of a great uncertainty. So all the problems are the very complex and also we have so-called systems of the systems, all this kind of issue is a comp compounding. Yeah. So um, to deal with this kind of trend of acceleration, we must adopt new approaches to respond with increased flexibility and speed. And also the society also uh, 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 embedded with uh, increasing uh, uh, complexity. So uh, they must be constantly uh, monitored and managed there. So, so anticipatory governance can help the government to take uh, a multiple feature possibilities into uh, account to make a quick decisions. Yeah, next please. And also um, the responsive governance, which is quite uh, self-evident. It means that uh, uh, the, those kind of responsive government um, uh, needs to recognize uh, um, that there's a growing public, public demand and also the government needs to quickly um, um, respond to the uh, needs of the people. And also the such kind of needs are also dynamically changing and evolving. Yeah. 
So um, the government need to uh, anchor, anchor their policy and strategy and programs activities to take into account of people's uh, uh, changing expectations, yeah, which particularly attention paid to local va va uh, variations and ambitions. Yeah, yes, uh, uh, so that caused the, uh, the importance of um, to take into the local uh, contextual situations, especially when we address the special demands and unique vulnerabilities of uh, those kind of vulnerable groups. Yeah, next please. And also this one, I will not uh, um, go into that. This one is about uh, the data intelligence uh, platform that created by the government of, of Bangladesh, uh, which facilitated the data-driven decision-making yeah, to minimize the, 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 the fatalities from the COVID-19. Yeah, next please. And also, uh, for the big data and big analytics, it's for like a risk informed governance. So, um, so this can risk informed governance, which also uh, based on the information and the data, they help the government understanding the threats, uh, threats or from the uh, risks through the risk assessment and management by harnessing the data. So they help the government anticipate, respond to re and recover from disaster effective. You can see, this kind of uh, the different phases of uh, disaster risk reduction. They can also promote access to critical and innovative public service delivery uh, during the disasters, yeah. So uh, the quality data sharing and data analytics is uh, enabled yeah, for DRR and, and resilience, yeah. Next, please. So uh, this one, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, how we use the data for mitigation planning. So uh, you can see that uh, <clears throat> they listed all the hazards and they give uh, uh, the ranking of the of the debt of the uh, risks like hazard uh, exposure data with hazard likelihood data and also anticipated consequence data next please yeah this data is about risk informed governance at the stage of the uh, to in the stage of uh, hazard monitoring and warning so you can see that uh, um, the government can use this uh, dynamic and real-time data through uh, those kind of uh, sensors or, or, or monitors. Yeah. So um, and also they can uh, government can also resort to the help of this kind of uh, area Im Im imageries and also uh, to uh, have a collaboration with the citizens. Yeah. For the uh, for the help. Yeah. Next, please. And also um, open data and the data at, um, and also data analytics can also be used uh, for a better inclusion of vulnerable groups. Yeah. So actually, uh, my colleague also mentioned already in the uh, in in her presentation about the in the target seventeen point eight eighteen about how they use the how the discrete data should be used for understanding the special vulnerabilities and needs of vulnerable groups. Next, please. And also, this also a case uh, in China, in Guizhou province, how they use the big data and the cloud computing for identify the real poor people. Next, please. Next. So this one is the case about two cities that they use uh, uh, the, um, the dashboard for COVID-19. The left panel is about the tracking the situation of those kind of elderly people, more than 70, yeah, so they identify why they are and also how to uh, distribute the better service to this kind of elderly people. Yeah, so um, uh, the left hand is kind of the uh, bottom uh, of the US, how the mapping uh, the community assets for uh, different uh, groups of vulnerable groups, yeah. Okay, so now I uh, turning the floor to uh, Mikkel. Thank you, Kepping. Now I will continue with the part three on leveraging data and youth engagement for SDG implementation. So um, as uh, Mr. Pogen Shim at the, at the very beginning of this lecture has also emphasized and highlighted the role of the youth in, um, uh, in achieving the SDG implementation is critical. And also in leveraging uh, data uh, is also very critical. We can see here that according to ITU, 
that uh, the proportion of young people aged uh, between 15 uh, uh, to uh, between 15 and 24 are using the internet, uh, using the internet is significantly higher than the proportion of the total population using the internet. And in 104 countries, more than 80% of the youth uh, population are uh, online. And here I would like to share uh, in this part some of the cases where the youth play a critical role, significant role in harnessing data that can contribute to SDG implementation. The uh, first example is the uh, using uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, which is based uh, on the crowdsourcing uh, platform uh, for mapping the disaster risk reduction. For example, in the Philippines, students, uh, university students contributed to the data compilation via this uh, crowdsource-based uh, uh, op uh, open stream map. Uh, they provide different information, uh, their uh, experience related to, uh, to the disasters such as the earthquake or, or the floods uh, that can enable effective and prompt uh, as well as anticipatory uh, reactions and decision-making in uh, uh, disaster response as well as uh, prevention and preparedness. And more recently during uh, COVID also the role of youth and harnessing data has been uh, highly uh, important. For example, in Nepal, according to the World Bank blog, you can see that youth in Nepal has been actively using data to respond to COVID-19. Uh, they use uh, data, particularly open data, for, uh, for example, to visualize uh, national and local COVID-19 data in an open uh, dashboard format. And they also uh, analyze social media in, uh, in terms of the COVID-19 situations. The initiative on the right is the uh, You Report Chatbot uh, initiative that is uh, uh, led by UNICEF uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, youth and uh, other NGO partners. This is uh, an open source uh, mobile messaging program managed at the country level in, in many different countries and users, mainly youth, uh, uh, can ask questions and receive uh, answers and they can also contribute uh, and participate in this information sharing process by sharing their ideas, experiences and, and information of it, about COVID-19 through SMS, uh, Viber, Facebook, Messenger and, and WhatsApp. And next one is about participatory budgeting and M voting. So in not only in this uh, disaster response and preparedness, but also in uh, decision making processes, uh, young people can harness data and, and contribute to, to, to decision making, which can uh, also contribute to SDG implementation. For example, on the right is uh, uh, what participatory budgeting uh, is. This is a um, example from New York City Council, where in in this uh, uh, open map, uh, residents can make suggestions, proposals on uh, the uh, agendas that would uh, would propose uh, to receive uh, the budgeting from the uh, local government. And uh, the proposed agendas here will be uh, also voted, selected through the voting of the residents. And this participatory budgeting is indeed uh, implemented in, in many uh, uh, countries and cities around the world. And Seoul Metropolitan Government, as well as other local governments in Korea also are, 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 are implementing this part participatory budgeting uh, by also sharing information through their website and using mobile uh, phones for citizens engagement through M voting. And here you can see that they also have specific participatory budgeting program for the youth where the young people can uh, participate in uh, uh, decision making for policy agendas. And based on that, um, important role of young people in harnessing data and uh, technology for SDG implementation. Another initiative by UNESCO is uh, also contributing to uh, building the skills of young people to better harness data and use digital technologies. For example, this um, initiative, Youth Mobile, uh, allows young people to create their own apps um, 
uh, through which they can um, share information on a, a variety of different fields that is related to SDG implementation, ranging from education, uh, peace and economy and markets information. So these are some information, uh, some innovative uh, uh, examples. Uh, due to time constraint, we could not include more, but uh, are some of the prominent examples that emphasize the important role of you, young um, students, for better harnessing data and uh, achieving SDG implementation. Yes, and uh, I'll uh, give the microphone back to uh, Kepin for uh, his continuation with the, the last part, please. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mikkel. Uh, next, please. Next, please. So I will quickly uh, 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 go through some uh, major policy issues yeah, about this uh, open data and data analytics and also how to leverage the data for the uh, public governance. Yeah. First one is that uh, uh, it's a very imperative to build a data-driven public sector. The public sector need, need to leverage data how to improve their performance. Yeah. So um, there's a, uh, the open data, data uh, big data and open data uh, and also big analytics that really provide huge opportunities uh, for the government. So um, they should uh, uh, um, leverage the data for the better anticipated governance and also they can better predict the policy solutions to design and their policy and a better de uh, delivery to their um, uh, citizens. And also they can do the better performance management. So the, uh, the and also of course the data, uh, not just uh, have a, like a tool of, uh, for the government. So uh, the data should become like a, a driver to streamline the government operations. Yeah, next please. And although we realize the, uh, the, uh, the huge value of the, of the data, uh, we should also understand that there's a, a lot of issues and uh, may appear so that we need to have a systematic approach to address all this issue. So the government should have um, a, the a systematic approach to, insti uh, to institute a robust uh, data governance framework to uh, leverage the, uh, the data, data value. Yeah. So, um, the main uh, pillars, you know, it's about like uh, for this kind of data governance, it's about the, uh, the government should have the policy and regulations, and they should have national strategies, and also should have a, a, a centralized leadership. They also, uh, the, the government should create the data uh, ecosystem, and also the, they should enhance the data technologies. Next, please. And also, there's also lots of concerns about the data privacy and also lots of uh, distrust from the citizens. Yeah. So um, the data privacy should become a, a huge policy concern for the government. So this kind of is a trend over the past uh, six years, how, the, how many countries have the, this kind of privacy uh, um, uh, statements on their online. Next, please. So, uh, and also um, the digital divide and digital exclusion is also become a, a very kind of important policy concerns, yeah? especially during the COVID-19, the internet had become a lifeline. And also there's also lots of, us, um, um, how to say, uh, policy uh, um, initiatives saying that the, the, the internet should become like a, a public good. Yeah? So this kind of chart shows that affordability and also subscription of the uh, internet uh, on per capita. So you can see from the left, uh, left uh, uh, from the right part, you can see that uh, the cost of the uh, mobile or broadband subscription is still very high for, uh, for the African region. Next, please. And also, of course, I mean, uh, the, the government should uh, nurture and build an open data ecosystem that you can see that from very beginning, I give you the, the, the chart, the open data, big data and the government data. So the government and the other kind of a business, business sector and the citizens should have a, a, a kind of a enabling ecosystem so that they can better use, better exchange the data. Next, please. And also, of course, I mean, uh, the, the, the data security become a very uh, important uh, issue. Now we hold a lot of uh, lots of reporting about a loss from the uh, data uh, security breach. 
Uh, so this chart is uh, <clears throat> showing that uh, how many countries they have a cyber security legislation, and also they have this HTTP e uh, extension to secure the, the security. Yeah, Next, please. Yeah, this one is about uh, <clears throat> e-resilience. Yeah, so as uh, we are more relying on the <clears throat> uh, ICT, the infrastructure are become so important, and also all these systems are, are interlinked, uh, so that. Uh, um, one system problem can be easily cascading in other kind of uh, systems. So uh, it's a very important to enhance the, the uh, e resilience of the infrastructure. Next, please. And also, of course, I mean, uh, we need to, <laughs> to better leverage the data. Our government officials and, uh, and as well as the, the society and citizens, they should uh, be empowered with more capacity to harness the data. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, that's all that we want to. Uh, um, uh, to present to you. So uh, time is really very short. Uh, yeah, so, but we want to try to impart as much information, as much knowledge in this area to our students. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Professor Zhang. Yeah, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Migyang Park and Mr. Keping Yao for their excellent uh, lecture. And then we learn a lot. Uh, I think that is time is up. So two things. So if you want to, uh, uh, confirm your attendance. Students, please write it down your name and student number uh, in the chatting room. Uh, and then also that uh, we have a survey link. Please go to there and then uh, uh, provide your opinion about this lecture. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Also, I appreciate that Mr. Shin Bogyun about this uh, excellent lecture too. Thank you. Thank you. Also, Professor Zhang. Yes. Yeah, because we don't have the time for interaction for Q and A for students. Sure. So if the students have any questions, mm -hmm. they can uh, send an email to us. Sure. So we are uh, pleased to further engage our students in this area. Yes. If, could if could you? We'll share yeah. our email address in the chat yeah, box. Yeah. Could you share the yeah email address in the chatting room? Sure. Then I sure. think that they can uh, use the information for later. Sure, we'll do that. Thank you. So for, for students who have any questions, feel, please feel free to reach us uh, via email and we'll be sure. uh, happy to answer to the extent possible. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Zhang. Yeah. Thank you. And the first Thank you. Jenny, Jenny, do you uh, share the questionnaires now? Mm -hmm. I shared the link. And Could you share you the can, link one you, more time? You can sure. explain about that. Okay, yeah, that, that is it's up there. So could you share the in down there one more time? Sure. After students, yeah. And then explain about the survey one more time. Sure. So this uh, post-event survey or evaluation uh, aims to uh, continue uh, our, uh, it aims to collect the uh, opinions and, and the feedback of our uh, participants, of uh, the students at KU and uh, your valuable feedback would be very uh, helpful to improve our events and to improve our uh, presentations for these students as well. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, students, please participate in the survey. That will be really helpful for the presenters also that uh, continue this program. So I think that uh, thank you all. Thank you for uh, uh, your participation. Also that I already, uh, I also, uh, again, appreciate the, uh, the lecturer's effort and then uh, Mr. Shim's um, uh, effort to uh, make this lecture possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you for your attention and participation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.